Welcome to Eye Contact. I'm Sean Hennahan. We're talking with Dr. Graham Barrett about IOL power calculations. Welcome, Graham. Thank you, Sean. To choose the power for IOL, Sir Harold Ridley devised a simple formula, 18 diopters plus 1.25 times the pre-op prescription, and he got half of his patients within a diopter. How are we doing since then? Um, I haven't quite seen the data that said he got a half diopter within 50% of patients, but his early results were lacking. So I think the very first uh, implant was something in the range of 18 diopters with 6 diopters of astigmatism. And there were some things missing in taking into account the difference in refractive index. But once they got it right, they settled down into using the standard lens power. And the next embellishment on that was the standard lens power times the 1.25 of the patient's refraction. And I can recall doing some implants using that formula. Mm. So things have changed uh, quite, quite dramatically. Um, the fact that we only were able to measure the axial length by ultrasound mm. came as late as the 19, early 1970s, it's quite sobering. So the field of prediction and more sophisticated formulae is quite uh, young in, in a sense. Um, when I think it's only a decade before I started ophthalmology that the first contact mm. A-scan ultrasound was available um, was something that really took me back because at the time I thought this was a mature, well-developed uh, stage of, um, of development, but it, it's actually still relatively young. And this is continuing to evolve as the OCT improves and so on, isn't it? Look, it is, and I think there's been an upsurge in interest in the last uh, decade or so. Um, a lot of our efforts initially were tied up with doing uncomplicated surgery not breaking the capsule. Um, and as we mastered the technology and the techniques, our focus has now changed to how do we get better outcomes. And so I believe if you look at the auditorium in, in a discussion on prediction and uh, astigmatism, it's usually quite full. I can remember in years, in years back, going to these sessions and having a very small turnout. Mm. So the interest is there, um, the technology has got better, the biometers are uh, a whole lot more precise than they used to be, and the formulae have developed in tandem. And now on the cutting edge, we have a number of data-driven formula in development. What do you think of those? I think it's um, a misconception to talk about formulae being either just theoretically based or data driven. There are some which are just theoretical and some which are just data driven. Some of the uh, ones that are utilizing um, pattern recognition, uh, the Hill RBF, but most theoretical formulae for some time contain an element of uh, data driven refinement. And so there's probably no theoretical formula today which doesn't have that element within it to uh, compensate for some of the things which are unknown in theoretical optics, such as the ELP position, position mm -hmm. of the lens. And um, I think that area can still develop. And I think you could probably find hybrid formulas which are basically theoretical optics. From my perspective, you should use every bit of theoretical optics you have to explain the optics as far as predicting the required lens. You then, um, if you have areas which you can't explain, come up with a theoretical model based on optics to explain that. And finally, where you really are unable to um, fully detail what you expect, that's when data-driven mm. um, refinements play a role. But I'd rather do as much measuring, much pure optics as possible, and reserve the data uh, refinement for what's still left over. The other approach is to do the whole thing based on data. Hmm. Well, now we have another thing to measure in terms of the posterior. How much is that going to add to our accuracy, do you think? Sure. So for the first time, we have devices commonly available which measure the posterior cornea accurately. And uh, obviously, this would be expected to add 
um, another uh, refinement, another increase in accuracy to your prediction. Um, it turns out, in fact, that for the average eye, the gain is not as much as you would expect, but the potential to reduce outliers, particularly with unusual eyes, um, is, I think, where this new measurement will play a role. Uh, it plays a role, uh, particularly for toric predictions, uh, and potentially plays a role for spherical predictions as well, as I said, in reducing outliers. And uh, finally, I believe this will play a role in post-refractive eyes, where the mm. fact that you don't know the posture cornea is one of the reasons for uncertainty. Um, I think we have to be fairly sophisticated how we utilize the posture cornea. The idea that everything that was unknown about the prediction of refraction is due to the posture cornea, particularly with astigmatism, I think is not quite true. Mm. If you base toric predictions purely on measurements of the posterior cornea, the results are not nearly as good as you would expect. So there's other elements um, within the eye which I believe uh, contribute to internal astigmatism. And if you have a formula or toric method of calculation which recognizes that, compensates for that, uh, you will get better outcomes and better predictions. Well, as you say, at a conference like this, uh, ESRS in Vienna, the sessions on biometry and calculation are very well attended. And yet, when we look at our ESRS practice survey that was done last year, a majority of surgeons are still using SRKT, and, and some of the new ideas don't seem to have trickled down to the ground level. What do you think of this process of, of the information disseminating, and, and what is it going to take, how long does it take for this to become real world? Look, I think it's happening. Um, it's still somewhat surprising for someone who's immersed in getting better outcomes, why someone wouldn't use something which is available, which is free, it's in biometers, it's available online, why they wouldn't instinctively utilize and immediately gain better outcomes. But I think we have to recognize the inherent conservatism of surgeons holding on to tried and tested um, but I think as we talk, that change is occurring. Um, people need to become familiar. Um, the new formulae have to be user-friendly uh, as well. And um, I just think it's a matter of time before uh, people move to more advanced methods of prediction because uh, any surgeon uh, would want to have better outcomes and better prediction for his patients. Very good. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us. For more information on this and related topics, please visit us at eurotimes.org.